want to, and after we open for comments, questions, suggestions to to our guests. Rashad, over to you, and thank you for doing this again with you. Thank you very much. Uh, I had the privilege uh, in uh, in um, uh, the, the spring meetings uh, to talk to a, a group that uh, Mark and Masood organized uh, on what our preliminary thinking uh, on the G20 is. And, and uh, this is almost like a report back on what, what, what else do we have to say, uh, having had this, uh, this, that conversation uh, in, uh, in, in the spring meetings. I should say that I would have liked to have had next to me uh, the, uh, the Director General of Treasury, who will be uh, the deputy with me, and in some ways the political leader uh, of the finance track. Unfortunately, uh, it was not possible for him to come. He's actually not even at the annual meetings, uh, but I will give you a sense of what uh, what uh, what uh, what the thinking is now. Uh, some of you were in the room uh, the last time, and I've I've asked myself the question since the time I gave some opening remarks. What have I learned a couple of months later? Um, and I've learned a few things. Number one is this is nothing profound, but I think that I've learned that when you're dealing with the G20, progress moves in millimeters, not in centimeters. I've learned that there's an inverse correlation between how ambitious you are and how much you can deliver. That doesn't have to be a trade-off. They sweet spots from time to time. Um, I've learned that, that one has to distinguish between content, strategy, uh, and, and tactic. Sounds very cliched, but I've come to the conclusion that very rarely in new presidencies do you see the germination of big ideas? What often happens is how you get mileage out of an existing core of ideas that have existed in every uh, G20. And how you take an existing legacy issue, repackage it, give it a new nuance, uh, how you're able to execute uh, on ideas that someone else developed for you. Uh, and I think that that is, uh, that is the uh, the the essence of, of some of the uh, issues I picked up. The other lesson I took out of the G20 is that timing and how you prepare is so critical. For example, we spent a couple of weeks uh, talking about, oh, we should be doing a stock take about the finance track, the last 25 years, how has it worked? It is on, the, you know, it, suddenly the, the, the Brazilians are doing this. It's going to be a discussion at this meeting. So what we have to do is saying, let's assess what kind of conversation comes from the stock take. Is it a dead end? Do we think that there's something there uh, to take forward? So, you know, those are the kind of, uh, it's, a, it's real time. It's, it's not something finite. Uh, it, it, and, and the goalposts are moving. Uh, and in that sense, uh, it's quite a difficult uh, exercise. So that's the sum of the lessons uh, uh, that I took out from you know the last meeting to now. And I was very privileged. I had Amara and a number of people with a meeting we organized in South Africa too. Now, wh wh what are the what are the preliminary ideas uh, that we put on the table? So, you know, we came to the conclusion uh, that the original purpose of the G20 was uh, strong bilateral sustainable growth and. One of the roles of the G20 was avoid zero sum, negative spillovers, beggar thy neighbor. And, and we, we essentially thought that we will open up the G20 on three important areas of discussion. The first, uh, there's always a discussion on, on the conjuncture. And in that, con uh, and in that discussion, uh, there are all sorts of issues about how you, 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 you capture, you, you problem problematize, uh, raise the questions. But on the th two others, I think the, the one is, you know, uh, we want to take climate uh, and economic growth uh, as one of the overarching framework areas. And we really want to build on what the Indonesians did is uh, they introduced on the macro side monitoring climate risks. What the Indians did is look at the macroeconomic impact uh, of climate transition. The Brazilians, I, I've just uh, seen a paper come now on the distributional policies of uh, of climate, and, and I guess our view is to take all that uh, and give it uh, uh, an, uh, an investment slant. Uh, and I'm reminded of the seminar that uh, the Peterson Institute organized in uh, uh, in in, uh, in in the spring meetings, and you know Nick Stern, who argued that 
you know, the core of new growth th theory, uh, at the heart of new growth theory is really uh, investment uh, in, in climate change and innovation. That's really going to drive growth. So that, you know, that's that's the, 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 the one bucket. The second bucket is really around productivity enhancement. Uh, and uh, and and what we're going to be looking at is the interface uh, between uh, between AI, uh, demographic change, and migration. Now, uh, I, I guess in the second in the second facet, uh, there is a concern that global growth is lagging, and we're going to look at this interchange uh, uh, whether AI uh, is a, uh, its impact on the labor market. Uh, uh, what risks and opportunities it provides. Now, in both in both climate change and AI, uh, one can end up having a very fragmented discussion because, you know, if you look at AI at the macro level, uh, one can look at it very differently to some of the AI issues looked at in the say the Financial Stability Board uh, and so on. So, so that that's more or less the big, uh, you know, over overarching issues. Now, there is a division of labor, as all of you know. Between the, the central bank uh, and and the treasury uh, on the finance track, uh, I think that many people in this audience uh, are very keen to want to get a sense of what are the big financial architecture issues that uh, currently in our arrangement uh, the, the 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 treasury uh, will be responsible for. I cannot speak uh, with the same authority that I can speak on some of the central bank issues, but I could say that. Uh, we've really struggled on debt restructuring. It's on, you're on the African continent. It's an African issue. But really, what is what is the avenue? What's the angle? What new innovation uh, can Sarvika bring? So, you know, someone suggest, suggested that Sarvika should, you know, institutionalize the sovereign debt uh, roundtable, uh, get a panel of experts in the African continent to speak at the G20 and give you a sense of how they're seeing the issues. I don't know whether there's going to be much movement there, but I think that the, getting the getting the angle uh, that could bear some fruit uh, on on debt restructuring uh, is, is is a difficult one. Now, there is a well-known agenda on 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 the MDBs. Uh, well, one of the areas that the Treasury wants to emphasize on the MB, MDBs is um, is really how do you rechannel the SDRs via the MDBs. Now you can say that's maybe naive. If if I if I remember Masood's uh, opening address in in Korea, uh, you know Masood argued that unless there's a radical change in the rules of S S SDR allocation, uh, it's very hard to kind of get any movement uh, on the uh, on on the M on the MDBs. Uh, but I think that I think that you know the the other interesting facet that uh, the our Treasury has been talking about is really this what has been. Uh, um, uh, ha harnessing the the um, uh, private capital uh, that would be uh, of no surprise. Now let me take two more minutes because you know it's really about getting uh, your reaction on the financial sector issues. I guess this is this is the part that the central bank uh, uh, will play quite quite an important role. What strikes me about the global issues in um, uh, in, in in the financial sector issues is that. 10, 12 years ago, you'd come to a, a, um, uh, the annual meetings of very little said about cross-border trade. Today, it is you know central uh, to, to, to everything. So three areas in the financial sector that, uh, that, the, the, that we are going to focus on uh, is the cross-border program. Uh, artificial intelligence, it will be different to artificial intelligence in the labor market, in the macro side. There, it's, it's really focusing on uh, on artificial intelligence in the financial sector, but more importantly, you know, what, one of the themes about uh, that Sarvika is advancing is that so much there's been so many good initiatives under, the, particularly the last few emerging markets. That what we want to do is, for example, the Financial Stability Board, which is a creation of the G20, has had so many recommendations. Uh, we want to look at all those recommendations, ask what has worked, what hasn't worked. So there's going to be a strong evaluation. Uh, evaluation process, you know, in the stock, uh, in, in in the cross border stuff. Now, you know, some of the some of the the fin financial stability board issues that the central banks champion are very much kind of 
a bit underwhelming for people who think about the big financing for development uh, and so on, so uh, uh, th those kind of issues. But I think that when you have geopolitical risks, it is these little issues where you make progress on. It's the big issues uh, that 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 you 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 can't uh, you know you don't get much done. So on the climate, I think that I think that um, there has been uh, also a view that we are going to focus more on uh, once again nothing unique. Uh, on scaling up uh, ad ad adaptation finance. We've been talking about, you know, pushing the uh, potential carbon market. There's been lots of uh, uh, pushback uh, on, on, on that. Finally, um, you know, one of the most important um, facets of the central bank is uh, notwithstanding the need to, to kind of go back to the original purpose of the G20 on growth, uh, the, the other side of the coin is what are the financial stability risks and there, uh, you know, we are going to, uh, there's a lot of fatigue on what are the issues around financial stability, but we are going to look at, uh, look at all, the, all the challenges, the vulnerabilities, taxonomies uh, in NBFI. I could say much more, but I, you know, I'd rather just leave it at that and take it, take it there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Masa, do you want to say? Uh... Uh, uh, actually, Mark, I think what would be better is let's, Let's get some okay, reactions, reactions and comments. I mean, I have a couple of thoughts just listening to Russia, but I'd rather come in. Let's let's listen to you. Okay. Yes. Uh Amar, obviously, please. Uh, so I think you can hear me as well. Yes. So um yeah, I think you know. what I I wanted to say is of course I'm thrilled on time and investment. That's my trade. So we're happy about that. I would just emphasize the tremendous opportunity for the African continent in the reopen in the year is next year. So it would be, you know, even when you look at South Africa itself, it's really creating the view that you take care of your own. And in the rest of the African continent, tremendous possibilities to leave from. And, you know, I know that the World Bank has announced this 300 million program, but I see it a little bit even more ambitiously. Africa has 50% of the world's solar potential, 1% of the investment. You close that gap, it's the biggest development payoff. So I think in the G20, focusing on that in very big ways, what it would take, both on the real side, but also on the financial side, would be a real play on the region. Second, from the international side, as you mentioned, I would really, there are two things that are really public right now, where there's good prospects of trying to get some paper, the role of credit rating agencies, for any of issue. And the second one is the regulatory cap impediments coming, you know, to coming to emerging markets. Uh, which, you know, we started discussing, as you remember, uh, but there's been a lot of further reflections on that. Uh, and, uh, you know, it would be great to have a partnership with the private sector, but really to push the, you know, the BIS and other, or the Basel and others to make some real changes there. I have some others. Thank you, Amar. Um, Mathieu, please, just behind, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm afraid that you'll hear, you'll have a, a little bit of a repeat of some of the things that Amar said, but I'll say them anyway so that other people will hear them if they haven't heard them. But I think it's really a very good idea to focus on the um, investment and growth element of the climate story. I think it complements what others have done in the past. I think it is a very strong Africa story. I completely second Amar's point that the development dividends of investment, particularly in renewables, have been grossly underestimated. The only thing I would add to Amar, I know he would agree with me, is that one element that needs to be resolved is cost of capital. So how do we tackle that cost of capital story? Because that's an absolute key to make it work. If you don't do that, then those opportunities on renewables will not materialize. And therefore, the comparative advantage in green industry that Africa could have will not materialize. So the cost of capital is crucial to that investment and growth story. The second point I wanted to quickly make is on regulatory frameworks. I think Amar already said it, and we talked about it in South Africa. There are very simple things that the G20 can do in two or three areas on regulatory frameworks and on resetting the expectation of fiduciary duties 
for asset managers in Europe and the US, which are currently not fit for purpose for the risks profile of investments in renewables in emerging developing countries in particular, and they need to be changed. So it's both regulations, but also resetting the framework around the expectation of fiduciary duty for asset managers. And then the other point I would have is, true that India focused on macro and climate, but I think that this is the year of the reform of the macro institutions. I think it would be very strange in the context of climate if the G20 did not have a voice on what are the priorities on macro and climate. And I think the last session on debt sustainability and, uh, uh, and uh, what can be done to particularly integrate nature in those uh, equations uh, will be very important. And I said, I think it would be strange if the G20 did not have a voice on that in a year where that will be at the center of the reform process. So those are three areas. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Hi, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, uh, you know, you when you were talking about this stock take, et cetera, it took us back to some of the work that we did at ICRIO when Indian presidency happened. So I'm digressing a bit from climate and other things, and I want to bring in the conversation on trade, something which was also discussed in the previous uh, session, cross-border issues around trade, and the fact that there's a ambitious African continental free trade area, which is coming up and which is and yet the intra-Africa trade remains really low, which is around 16 to 17% of its total trade. I feel it's very important to bring the conversation, um, continue the conversation rather on global value chains and making them more resilient. And I think Africa is very well placed to lead, lead that discussion, both by example and the fact that there's a lot of continuity around this topic, which is happening in the G20. So one of the uh, trade and investment working group issues could be around global value chains. Yes, uh, Michael. Uh, thank you very much and for taking the time to give us the update. Um, speaking from the perspective of philanthropy and civil society that's been supporting the last few G20 processes, I actually just wanted to give very positive feedback on that central point you made about looking to really bring to implementation you know that so many of the ideas that have been developed over as you rightly say very very um powerfully run and, and innovative uh preceding g20s but the agenda is now very broad i mean particularly brazil has has put in a, a tremendous amount of effort in but but I, I really think your focus on on looking at what is already in process and on the table and and thinking about how to take some of that to the point of you know, firm implementation. You know, I think there are some areas that FSB has been <laughs> nudged a few times on certain issues, and yet we have not actually seen change in a meaningful way. And so, I think many of us would would want to support in whatever way works for you and and for the rest of the African government to help you with that particular theme, because it's a great opportunity now to cement. Uh, some of these changes that have been put out there, but not not really finished in that in that sense. So I, I really wanted to give very positive feedback on that idea that you you set out at the start. Thank you. Yep. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Deepak Mishra. I represent a think tank in Delhi called Indian Council of Research on International Economic Relations, ICRIA. And we worked very closely with the Indian presidency during the G20. Um, uh, just want to say that there's a lot of expectation and hope uh, with the South African presidency. Uh, Indian um, government is really looking, I, I don't represent the government, but I know there's a lot of excitement with the South African presidency, especially, I think, by the way you calculate, this could be the silver jubilee, the 25th anniversary of the G20, assuming it started in 1999. The, I have two uh, specific things. One is you uh, talked about evaluation, and I think that's a very important topic, though uh, hardly talked about, that G20's credibility has been slightly under assault because a lot of promises are made, but very little actually get achieved. So it will be really important not only just look at uh, evaluation in a sector, but it could be that you could actually look at evaluation of many of the G20 uh, uh, commitments and achievement. Um, but more important is what can G20 actually do in its architecture to make things more tractable? So 
kind of looking at the structure, G20 is a very inclusive organization, the way the T20 works, the engagement groups work. So it's very good. But I think one of the big shortcomings of G20 has been the lack of monitoring and evaluation. The MDB work that we did, where we did a global survey, most experts thought that G20 does not do a good job when it comes to monitoring and tracking the commitments they have done. The second suggestion I have is that I think the, the topics that you mentioned are all very good, but I was wondering which one is very Africa specific. And uh, in the in during the annual meeting, there's a lot of discussion that you can see on the World Bank uh, building about SDGs being off track. In many cases, it will take 90 years, 100 years to get to the SDG. And I think G20 as a global body had a commitment and to help to make sure that the world achieves the SDG target. So I was wondering whether an Indian uh, 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 presidency did push it, but I don't think there's a, any tractable outcome to say how can world and especially African countries achieve the SDG and what can G20 do about it? Thank you. Thanks. Mr. Please. Yeah, I make uh, just a, uh, if I can react to, to a couple of, you know, I have a couple of points which are, before I get into a substantive point, I. I think let's look at the process and timetable. The G20 presidency is relatively short. You'll have, I think, when is your summit next year? Uh, have you got a date for the summit? Roughly? November. Yeah. So you basically have a year, you know, from summit to summit. And uh, time goes away quickly. And the other thing I would say is that if you have... A couple of things that you're pushing really hard, and I thought that was in a way the sort of experience from the Indian presidency was that they picked fairly early a couple of areas that they were going to really push on, and then organized a process that gave it impetus and and uh, brought in content and and brought in expertise and and they were able to advance on that. Historically, it seems to me, and there are others here who've been involved in many more G20 processes, but historically, it seems to me the more likely to get traction. The other uh, point is that, I mean, that's, with, nobody has mentioned this yet, but uh, we have an election in the US in two weeks' time. And, hmm? and, and, and the US is the subsequent recipient of whatever you hand over. So that will have an impact on what kind of G20 there will be and, and how much you can proceed. So I would also just counsel, I mean, you're not going to finalize anything right now, but really they, this, you need, I mean, there's another conversation to be had post November, whatever it's going to be. I said five in an earlier meeting today and somebody jumped on me and said, the results not going to be known for, so whatever it is, I think we need another conversation before um, you can sort of define how much of it is protecting. Then on substance, oh, you know there are some things where you hope to advance, building on what's been there to the point where it's either across the line or or close to the line by the time you finish and hand over. And others where you initiate, but with a view that this is going to take another one or two years before it's going to get to closure. And I think the ideas that you had, you know, particularly the growth story. On growth, the one thing that I've, I would say is that in addition to the sort of growth and climate story, there is actually a broader questioning right now of what is the model for growth, including to what extent is industrial policy in some form now part of the standard package of policy measures to enhance growth? And somehow I think it'd be useful to, to link that into however we do it. And one other topic which you didn't mention, but I have a feeling that next year might be the year when the IMF is more ready to move on some of its reform things. And the one thing that keeps coming up is the gaps in the global safety net, which currently do not cover 
most of the countries in Africa actually are outside a global safety net. So if you're a rich country, you have access to swap lines and all the rest. And if, even if you have a few selected markets, you have emerging markets, you have access to bilateral swap lines. Maybe you now have access to Chinese swap lines. I'm not quite sure how effectively they'll work. But something on enhancing the IMF's toolkit to, to provide more comprehensive and usable safety net might have traction next year. And I think the IMF itself is keen to advance on that. So a G20 umbrella and a G20 push might help to, to move that uh, forward. So I want to suggest that as a uh, piece of work as well. Uh, Rachel, before I give yeah. you uh, the floor, I think Eric uh, yeah. will have some comments. Thank you, Sir, sir and, and uh, thank you for inviting me to this conversation. And I, have, I was had the privilege of being part of the previous conversation that Kasim uh, referred to as well. So it was very uh, interesting to hear your reflections um, since then. So, so a few first uh, one comment on process, and I very much agree with what what uh, Masood said about you know how the Indians worked and how I, th I think when they created this. Uh, group, uh, you know, everyone was saying that you're not going to get anything out of this uh, because, you know, everything was dealt with in the eminent persons group and so on. But actually, by creating that group, you, you built in the momentum into it and, and they had to deliver and they did deliver. I think there, there was a very significant addition to, to sort of our understanding of, of how this policy, particularly for the MDB reform agenda. So, so I think thinking about how you could do that. How can you build in that kind of momentum that, that um, the Indian presidency uh, uh, did? On, on, on so three um, areas that I think, uh, you know, some of them have been referred to already in, in different ways. But, so I agree with what Mattia and, and also, I should say, this is gonna be the year of macro institutions. So how do you integrate IMF into that again, the, you know, the eminent persons group that it tried to combine the um, the uh, development agenda and the financial stability agenda. I think that has been lost a little bit in 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 the conversation, and and that's what Masood is, is is referring to. I would argue also that the you know integrating there also the IMF more in the development and 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 and. Uh, and uh, how should I put it, um, in, 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 in the development uh, and climate again. So, so I think these things are no longer separable. And so, so IMF has moved a lot in this space, and, but I think there's actually still a lot to do. And, and many things that, um, you know, we had a previous panel today actually that, that, that I think pushed a, a little, little bit the envelope of, of, of what is currently discussed, but I think there's a lot more to, to do there. And, and, um, you know, IMF has a long track record of, of building core institutions, even in very fragile environments. And, and you know, how do you bring this to, to implementation on climate, for example, and, and the implementation of this um, agenda that Amar is, is referring to, you know, I think there is uh, a lot uh, left to, to be done there. Uh, I very much agree with the comment on integrating nature into climate. I mean, the Brazilians have done a great job of that, but it's still not 100% there. And I, th I think a lot of the conversations are, are missing that. And the final point I want to make is on, on, on I think connecting this as a, was a comment on, on, on DVCs, uh, you know, DVCs, uh, the global value chains, they, they are, you know, tremendous implementation tools. I mean, they, you know, what they do is, you know, the lead firms of these uh, value chains, they, they impose standards throughout the global value chain, and and if we could use them, you know, much more systematically on on um, the climate and nature agenda, and you know where they, you know, every investment there in 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 that uh, in in uh, in the decarbonization is an infrastructure investment, and and you know much of this infrastructure has to be built in Africa. So think linking global value chains, trade. Uh, resilience infrastructure, I think, is is something. There's uh, the Brazilians had a a topic on on 
on cross-border infrastructure, uh, that report will now be endorsed by the ministers. And so I think there is, that just go, superficially touches on this topic, but so looking at, you know, how do we connect the, the trade agenda, the, uh, you know, cross-border uh, um, aspect of, of um, sort of um, these value chains and um, the kind of nature uh, climate agenda. It's a little bit vague in my formulation, but, but I think you know what, what I'm uh, getting at. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, some, some, some quick reactions. So the issue uh, Mateo, of cost of capital. So it's come up, I, I think one of the previous spe uh, speakers talked about a cost of capital commission I guess, I guess in a lot of these, in a lot of these uh, very interesting ideas, we kind of struggle with, with you know, what is the direction you want to go and how you're going to get the traction. You know, I think that South Africa pays uh, has um, the ten year yield is twelve percent, uh, when the average ten year yield of the sovereign bond in the Latin American countries are eight nine percent. It's not a G20 issue. It's a it's a risk premium of the South African economy, uh, but but I think that so so I guess I, I kind of feel like being a PhD student every time someone says an idea and I think how are you going to problematize what's the hypothesis what's going to be feasible I think it's the very important issue if we don't mention it is because we're still struggling uh, conceptually with how to do it I'll give you another example another example is in the Financial Stability Board there's been a lot of consideration about. One of the biggest risks in the global economy is this banking sovereign nexus. That banks are acquiring uh, lots of bonds. Uh, it's big on their on their balance sheets, uh, and it was partly a function of increasing fiscal uh, debt issuance, partly a function of in emerging markets non-residents pulling out uh, and so on. But once again, you know, when you, when you go to the S FSB and and talk about it, so what what exactly is the issue? Uh, you want to take forward. What is it that you want a global cooperation on? Uh, it, it, it's very, very hard. And I think that so, so, and it, it kind of leads me to the global financial safety net. You know, I was saying to Masood yesterday, the very interesting uh, meeting that he, him and Mark organized is that uh, we, we, for example, uh, in South Africa have um, uh, about $60 million, a billion dollars of reserves which in the scheme of things is, is quite, you know, it's not that bad given the size of the economy. We have a FEMA facility and we actually feel that we don't really, really need, we can do with a FEMA facility. It'd be nicer to have a swap line. In addition to that, we have, the game has changed with many private sector firms offering liquidity facilities at much cheaper rates than they have in the past. So, you know, I guess the question is, what is the issue that right. we want to take uh, at the global level. And I think that there's an opportunity between now and when we go to the deputies meeting in December and set the agenda. So, 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 so issues are uppermost in our minds, but, but it's, it's, it's look, the litmus test. Why is it attract? A why will you get traction at the G20 level is, is, is the area uh, where we're struggling. Now, the, the issue on, on the free trade area, you know, the, the question we were asking ourselves is, what is it that Africans can do themselves that they don't need the G20 for? And what is it that you need the G20 for? So if you look at uh, intra-African trade, it's very low uh, because there's poor infrastructure amongst countries. Yeah, the, the African Free Trade Agreement will, will go some way in reducing barriers, but that's not the major deterrent. The major deterrent, these are small economies. They don't have much to trade with each other. Uh, so, so. There's a lot of excitement. When I speak to the private sector, they say, you know, this is the thing you, South Africa, there's a, the B20 says, this is what you must cha champion. Uh, uh, the uh, build on the initiatives of an exciting uh, project uh, in, in the continent. Uh, once again, uh, uh, it's kind of just making this decision of how you get, what is it that you want Africans to decide on? What is it that you need uh, a global cooperation? Uh, I'm saying this more as a, as you know, uh, uh, our thoughts are not mature in this area. So the, the other thing that I guess uh, on the SDGs, it's a big, big issue on the Sherpa track. Uh, in fact, when we were 
we we realize that uh, that uh, uh, an area like SDGs, but even an area like AI, is featuring everywhere. It's featuring in the health track. It's featuring in uh, in the education track, in the finance track. And I think that one of one of the one of the dilemmas is that you know the finance track operates a, a bit separately uh, from from the Sherpa track. I found out for the first time that the Brazilians have tried to uh, work around, you know, uh, uh, work, work work around around that. Uh, but but so so, I'm very aware of the fact that our agenda looks a bit more diluted compared to the Indian agenda. You know, I you know the Indian said we're championing two things: crypto regulation and scaling up the MDBs, and there was a whole series of uh, activity around that. And I was very, very, I just joined in, in my capacity as deputy governor, I was just given the international, uh, when the Indians took over, so I'm a really newcomer uh, to the area. And I'm aware that we actually haven't done that. But I also am aware that, for example, on the MDBs, thanks to the Indians, there's this massive expert right. group panel. There was really no need for us to kind of mobilize around it, uh, uh, in the way that the Indians did the the groundwork, and you know, and 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 we, uh, uh, you know, we like Korea. We're not we we didn't develop the cars. We're doing it through imitation in the first part of the industrial strategy. That that South Africa is the Korea in in, in imitating uh, the others uh, and so on. But but I think that the, these are these are very valuable comments. And and um, uh, I mean, I'm happy to, um, uh, to. I mean, I I worry when people say uh, when people say that uh, that. There's a lot of expectations from South Africa. I I, I feel yeah. you're going to be underwhelmed, uh, I, and I hope not. Uh, you know, we we are working very closely. We think we've got the logistics sorted out. So at least if you get your logistics sorted out, you don't embarrass yourself. So the baseline may be there. Right. Uh, we have a beautiful city of which we're organizing the uh, the FMCBG in Cape Town. That in itself will just work in advantage for those of you like good Pinot Noirs and Chardonnays. That sort of. But but. Uh, um, but that 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 is that is that is the real challenge. Uh, bringing on board government uh, and making sure uh, the, the 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 government is 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 announcing a few task forces. I don't know what they mean. Is it just uh, crowding the agenda? But we'll we'll have to wait 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 for that space. Yes, can I ask you a yeah. question, uh, Rashad? Because I think it may be helpful for others. Uh, the way you said, look, by the first deputies meeting. We need to have a sort of, this is what we would like to achieve. You know, you need to have a clear sense of what success looks like. And in some areas at this stage, it's hard to define. You know, what would be the practical manifestations? Yeah. Are there topics on which you would find it useful if people sitting around this room were between now and December to offer you those those ideas say look this is the 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 concrete manifestation of what this idea that i've been proposing would translate into so that and then you have to decide whether you have traction or doesn't have traction uh, whether it's priority or not but would it would you like any inputs from people between now and december or or would that not be helpful i you know i think that i think that what I would like is we have a sense on the issues uh, that are outlined. Right. What, 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 I, what I think is is some of the areas that we point out, the global safety financial net uh, and and um, uh, what is what is African about it? Yes. You know, th those are areas where I, th I, still, I still, but even in the areas that that I mentioned, it's still quite superficial. You know, there's a lot of scope uh, to, to flesh out. The one thing I didn't think about is what role the South African G20 can play in this whole reform of the Bretton Woods. You know, that's that's a big area. Uh, would it play a very important, provide a very important forum to have a discussion? Should we invite the three-person team to come to one of the clean, I mean, you know? Oh, no, that's so good. Yeah, but that's not a, you know, that's just a, by the way, uh, thing. Yeah, yeah Nancy. Right. Okay. Uh, and just picking, excuse me, just picking up your point on what can the G20 do 
that Africa can cannot do on its own. And then the point about Amar's point about regulation. Um, and then the other point about cost of capital. Um, I very much agree with Amar's point about, uh, you know, having the FSB or um, the, the convening the regulatory authorities on, you know, a, a evidence-based risk assessment uh, in Africa. But in addition, the, you might think about having the FSB take up the issue of um, country adaptation strategies and their implications for risks for the financial institutions in the country and for the sovereign risks. Because there's a lot of emphasis. I, I, I'm not up to date on what the FSB is doing, but they obviously are incorporating mit mitigation emissions risk. I'm not sure they're incorporating risks from either, you know, either a reduction of risks because of adaptation investment or rising risk from a failure. And that's something particularly relevant for, for Africa. So it seems to me FSB has not been, you know, a front and center in recent G20s, bringing them in on regulating institutional investors and pension reforms, but also trying to get some benefit from African countries that are um, investing in adaptation in their, um, <clears throat> in their ratings and therefore in their cost of capital would be a useful thing to do. Yeah. Sorry, I have a lot of G20 sitting inside me. So, you know, uh, there's one point I wanted to make because you made a very interesting point on AI demographic change and migration. You know, this topic, something very similar was picked by uh, the Argentinians in 2018, yeah. which was the future of work agenda of the G20. And here I'd like to talk about two things. You know, you, you just mentioned that what issue do you really pick up? Pick up? <clears throat> that year, all the international organizations, and here the role of IO is very important, were talking about future of work, whether it was the World Economic Forum, whether it was the OECD, uh, whether it was uh, any other UN body, they were talking about future of work. And I think the role of international organization and experts on that conversation becomes very important to pick up that specific issue that you'd like to pursue through your presidency. So I feel uh, that's something that we learned even when we were doing this MDB reform agenda, because we felt that there was both a push and a pull factor. The fact that we had something um, sort of crafted a broad topic and then there was a pull because there was already a buy-in coming from a lot of different agencies that sort of kept the topic together and got us those concrete ideas to push. Okay, we take uh, two more comments before I know we get Rasha yeah. uh, over there and after Michael. Yes. There we go. Um, I think something that will be incredibly important is also this domestic capital mobilization agenda and the deepening of domestic financial markets. It's inherently important for the continent. South Africa has a really good story to tell, given your pension pool. And we're seeing, I think, this discussion about FDI and the need to attract international capital for climate positive growth. But that it, continues to have a sort of north to south flavor to it. And if we don't say, well, Nigerian pension funds, Namibian pension funds, Botswana pension funds are growing faster than a lot of other countries in the world. And that this is where you'll also tackle some of the currency risk. It will be an incomplete agenda, I think. And it's a very um, exciting thing to be talking about $17 trillion under management currently in emerging markets and developing economies. And some of the estimations say that could be 45 trillion by 2040. That's huge pools of capital that could drive domestic climate positive growth often without the currency risk. And I think that could be very exciting. One other point is just to say on narrative and it fits with this future of work, there have been uh, challenges around the green agenda, around the multilateral and globalization agenda. And if this G20 can really be grounded in green is about jobs, green is about growth, you know, multilateralism is about tackling some of these um, competitiveness issues. I think you'll have really strong social buy-in um, rather than 
uh, constantly saying it's a climate agenda. If we talk in language of energy security, food security, resilience, you're also going to get people really behind you. Thank you. Thanks. Sorry to jump around, but it was just going back to the excellent point that was made. Um, you know, th there is some work ongoing that's come out of some of the last three G20s around some of these issues of linking, whether it's JetPs, the country platform work Brazil did, we have V20 countries with the climate prosperity plans, but then that is not being reflected, uh, either the green industrialization or the adaptation or resilience investments in how uh, IMF DSAs and credit rating agencies will follow. And it's very tangible. It's something that I, I to your point, the G20 has real jurisdiction over. It's a regulatory issue. Um, it's also a Bretton Woods issue. Um, and these are the kind of things that have been started, but actually taking that to the point where something was really firmly landed in changes would, would bring together you know, several of the themes that you've had. So I, I just wanted to echo Nancy's point, thanks. I'm good. good. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, good. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's six o'clock. So yeah. perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Rashad. Thank you, Masoud. So look forward for your presidency. Uh, so tomorrow we will continue our conference. So it's going to be more global macro issues, emerging market resilience that will be discussed. Uh, so you are welcome to join. Thank you again, Rashad. Thank you, Masoud. Thank you, Mark. Okay. So thank, you. thank you.